I don't want to die here. No, 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 no. Stay away from me. Get away. Get away. Get away. This is too dangerous. I don't, I don't really want to be here. All right, we need to get out of here. All right, I'm going to jump across to here. This looks sick. I missed the jump. Okay, so we're going to go further into the bastion. This is, this is less safe. Less safe, okay. All right, we'll get back to that in a minute, but for now, let's do what we always do and lay out the plan for today. We're gonna spend most of the day in the nether, first for the netherite template, and then full netherite gear. After that, I wanna build a magma farm in order to build a gold farm, and, you know, Minecraft stuff. Once we have all that gold coming in, I'd love to build a sheep farm in the end that relies mainly on powered rails. And then our main build project for the day is to come home and build a large Buddha statue and island retreat that we can connect to the mainland later. And that brings us back to the nether. If you remember in an earlier episode, I found a bastion, grabbed coordinates, but said we were far too early in the world to deal with that. Well, today we're dealing with that. This bastion's important because the chests at the very bottom have a 100% guaranteed spawn rate for the netherite template. I don't have to go search 10 or 12 bastions and hope I find it. I know it's in here. But I also know these guys are here, and plenty of them. My favorite way to deal with piglin brutes is not to. Bow spamming every brute I can see before I get in the bastion is my preferred strategy, though it's not 100% foolproof and I am a pretty big fool sometimes. I know these ones are in another tower entirely, but I don't need them somehow being alerted to my presence, so as long as I can see them, I kill them first. I don't mind having to fight piglins generally, although high numbers can get overwhelming, but brutes just hit way too hard to mess with. The next step is to punch a very wide open hole in the top of the bastion so I can get out if needed. An escape route is super useful, and one of the reasons bastions can be very dangerous is that you can get stuck inside the walls with their narrow walkways and it can be very difficult to escape if you get caught in there. This open top allows me to continue raining fire down on my enemies from an absolutely untouchable spot. And once I think there's at least a chance I can get to the chests, I'll sip a fire resistance potion and head in. I take the fire res pot because ultimately my escape would be to dive into the lava. I know the brutes and piglins can't follow me there, only the magmas. My first dive here is a little bit of bait. I want every enemy who could get to me to show themselves and jump on me so I can fly back out and kill the most obvious threats before I head back in. Then a second dive will give me some room to shoot the ones on the side as well, and I can bait out more piglins, but hearing too many brute sounds got me to bail on this attempt as well. Finally, I'm on the bridge just above the magma spawner. Breaking that's important because magma can mess me up very quickly, but this is a somewhat safe space to shoot into the walled areas at any remaining brutes. With the spawner gone, I can focus on finishing off some piglins before diving down to get my loot. One last brute and it should be safe to drop into the treasure area. I'm going to disconnect it from the rest of the bastion so it's more difficult to get to me though. And now we can safely check on our loot. Well, that's a really nice chest. Let's get some debris, another right scrap, four diamonds, as well as the netherite template. And in the other chest, well, we get two more ancient debris, another template, diamond sword. And I will need a little bit of gold before I make a farm for it later, so I'll grab some of this for now. We need diamonds to duplicate the template, but the tunnel bore itself has already provided us with 40 in our base and another 27 down here. Let's lay out all of these now and fortune three the ores now. How much do you think we'll get out of 67 ores? And in the end, I ended up with 163 diamonds. That's not terrible at all. And now I can duplicate the template just like this, where two of the templates makes four. Four is gonna make us eight, and I'll make 16 out of that. And that's more than I need for now. So now onto the fun part. Let's make a bunch of TNT and go blow stuff up in the nether. Eight stacks of TNT should be a good start. I also wanna smelt up the few bits of debris I already have so we can make our first ingot now. Then I can apply that using one of the new netherite templates, and we have our first piece of netherite gear. I want to do that now because we'll be digging quite a lot in the nether and having the extra durability can only help. I don't really mind digging tunnels and manually mining for ancient debris. I find it kind of relaxing as long as I have a fire res potion in my hotbar. There's not a whole lot that will attack you in a narrow tunnel below the lava in the nether, so it's simple to dig a tunnel, fill it up with TNT, explode it, and collect the debris. And then when I run into a lava pocket or lava lake, I simply stop the tunnel there. For optimal results, your TNT should be every four blocks apart, but honestly after a while I stop counting and start spamming it a little bit. Spamming is a bit less efficient on TNT, but a lot faster, so you have time to do more. It's kind of a trade-off, honestly. Having a flame bow does make lighting the TNT easy, although if this TNT hits a piglin, they will aggro to you because you set it off. There are ways around it, but for the ease, I'll take this trade. Generally, you don't aggro anyone unless you set off two tunnels close to each other. I started out this ancient debris hunting with this ugly texture pack on that highlights ores. It's from Vanilla Tweaks if you want it, but I turned it off after a few minutes because I found it more annoying than helpful. I guess I'm not that blind yet. Ignore the two or three pieces I missed during the time lapse. My ancient debris luck in this world has been absolutely awful. At some point I'll show you all the areas I've mined trying to get debris for the tunnel bores. Today was, unfortunately, not a lot different. My debris luck still seems to be awful. I was finding as much by mining long tunnels as I was by blowing them up with hundreds of TNT. Anywho, let's hunt for some debris now.
Okay, back with my 37 new debris, and that's a fairly successful little mining adventure despite my bad luck. It's time to cook that up, as well as grab some of the gold from earlier to make ingots. I should be able to make 10 total, which should be all that I need if you include the ones that are already on my silk touch pick. I didn't yet have a good chest plate, so I had to quickly make one of those before adding the netherite. I've been carrying an iron chest plate up until now, but that's easy enough with my librarians down here. Okay, this is the last time you're gonna see me in full diamond for this series, so take a good look now. Let's play see if you can spot the mistake. It's a big one. Look at me, full netherite, including all weapons, tools, and gear just as I should be. I made this netherite silk hoe, let's make the fortune hoe into netherite as well. While I'm here doing upgrades, I thought it'd be smart to get a few extra tools upgraded, so I put mending and unbreaking on my flint and steel, my shears, and eventually a brush. I also added the same enchants to a bunch more elytra, so all of my elytra is now maxed out. My gear feels so much better now, but did you catch the mistake? I'll bet you didn't. So when I need to get a few books for more book enchants, I normally keep a very basic fortune axe in my villager area. My better axe is silk touch though, so I knew I couldn't use that. Did you see it? Can you sense my confusion? My silk touch axe is not the one that's got netherite on it. My unbreaking two, fortune one, is the one that has netherite on it. Yeah, I put netherite on a crappy axe, like a noob. And then I used up every single netherite ink that I have. Oops. The funniest things happen sometimes, but after hours of mining for debris, my luck turned pretty quickly. I found three debris almost immediately. Then not long after, I found another three altogether as well. I kept mining for a bit of extra and found three more. I barely moved on before finding yet another three pieces. I found exactly zero veins of one or two on this whole second trip. Four three veins and I was out. A quick repair of everything and it was time to upgrade the correct decks this time. So after adding Unbreaking 3 to it, I finally made it netherite and could move on. Full netherite is actually done. Gold farms require a huge amount of resources to build. The gold farm I want to build today requires over 10,000 magma blocks or almost 6 shulkers full. Collecting this manually in the nether is a dangerous time sucking job and at the end of it, you get your gold farm but that's all. If you ever need further magma blocks for any other project, whether that's farms, building, or terraforming, you're going to need to collect more. For this reason, I almost never collect the magma blocks for a gold farm directly from the nether. I build a magma cream farm, AFK it, and then build the gold farm. However, in this series, it's been my goal to AFK for as little time as possible. I want to maximize my first thousand days in a way that very few or no players have ever done. So how can I achieve my goal of building a magma farm and having almost no AFK time? Well, the magma farm I normally build produces a respectable 5,000 cream per hour, or a bit under 1,500 magma blocks. This means building the farm for 1-2 to two hours and AFKing for another 8-9 to nine hours, or spending anywhere from 9-11 to 11 hours in total. That's too much, way too much for my hardcore world. So I found a design online, the Mega Magma Farm by Fortunate Diamond. The link will be in the description. This design's fairly new, with the tutorial having been out for only about two weeks when I chose to build it. Fortunate's design produces over 70,000 cream per hour. In my own experience, it's been more like 80,000. That's just over 15 times as fast as the Shulker Craft or They6 designs, 30 times faster than Kelp MC's farm, and even obliterates portal spam design like Gilly 7CE's by producing over five times as much magma cream. In the end, this farm takes around two hours to prepare, two hours to build, and just 30 minutes of using it to get the 10,000 magma blocks required for the gold farm. Using this farm saved me at least five hours and gave me a nearly unlimited supply of magma cream or magma blocks for any future projects. And building this farm was infinitely better than mining magma manually. Fortunate Diamond has a showcase of the farm on their channel and you can check it out for a bit more information around how it works, but essentially I'm going to build an efficient, portal-based looting magma farm that can be converted to also produce frog lights later on. So make sure you drop Fortunate a sub, they have some really good tutorials over on their channel, a lot of them are very new. And the work you've been seeing is the result of my infrastructure keeping this possible. My dark oak farm gave me the wood for the chests and hoppers, the lava farm for buckets, the tunnel bore gave us the cobbled deep slate for solid blocks. Almost everything I do in this world comes back around to help us in other projects, and the speed I can keep moving is 100% because of the planning and the work that came before it. Getting the obsidian for this farm takes over half the prep time, and if I'd built an obsidian farm early on, there's no telling how much time that would have saved me overall. It's been the one critical oversight in the world. Now that I have the gravity duper storage in place, that's much harder to do without ripping it out and starting over. We're now ready to begin. We'll build the spawning platforms and nether portals, the kill chamber, and then the overworld side of the farm.
with the magma farm built, it's time to test it out. Like the stacking raid farm, this farm uses an armor stand to hit with sweeping edge to pass all the damage to the mobs in the kill chamber. Looting also passes through the armor stand, so our drops are multiplied. Just five minutes of hitting this armor stand gives me more magma cream per hour than an AFKing one of the next best options. It's a really fantastic farm. The results of this farm in just a few minutes were actually quite astonishing. I normally expect farms to slightly or even drastically underperform the stated rates, so I'm amazed that this farm not only hit the 70,000 promise, but exceeded it. After that quick test to ensure all was working, I went back and finished around 30 more minutes of AFKing this farm. So let's call the magma farm done. It is not lost on me that an obsidian farm was missed, and I'm back to mining obsidian pillars in the end again. The gold farm I'm building today is one that I'm familiar with. It's Dash Pump 4's 1650 gold blocks per hour gold farm. I built this a couple of times on past playthroughs. As of the time I was recording, this was one of the best single player gold farms you could make. I'll plan to upgrade this in the future, but for now, 1650 gold blocks is more than enough gold to line our pockets, and more importantly, run a piglin bartering farm. Also, I really need to update my dark oak farm to the latest version now that we're basically done designing it. I hate having to get saplings each time, but the the farm is so fast and it's very useful for chests, hoppers, etc, and the farm uses a lot of those. We'll also grab sand for glass and use the Wither Skeleton Farm's Super Manual Smelter to smelt through that. Yes, I do plan to make a real smelter soon. I do get a lot of extra skulls while I'm there though. Time to collect all of our glass out of the furnaces and then head home. And in this massive pile of shulkers we should have everything we need to build the biggest farm we've made in the world so far. Except I forgot turtle eggs. I need a farm for this. I hate having to manually get these each time as well. I also miss when turtles could be infinitely bred quickly. That was a good bug. Sometimes Moyang fixes the good bugs and it's unfortunate. Finally, the one thing you want to have when building almost any gold farm is a great set of Frostwalker boots. I always put Feather Falling 4 on mine because I forget that I'm in Frostwalker boots and I land too hard otherwise. The last thing I want to do is use a totem because I forget what boots I'm wearing. Alright, the farm's gonna go right here. Let's unload everything and get started. Okay, the farm is now built and I'm ready to turn on the storage system. 
In my rush to finish the farm, I might have made just one small oversight. Right, so I might have actually forgot to light the portals in the farm. I guess it won't work without this. Also, I'm glad I put on breaking on the flint earlier. We're gonna need that. At the very bottom of the farm, I actually found this tangle of piglins. I could kill them, but it's actually easier just to light the portals and let them go through up to the top. But with that, I think we're actually ready to test the farm this time. Let's go back up here. There are actually piglins here. This is a good sign. The sword I'm using for this farm has neither knockback nor fire aspect, so it's the right sword. Same as the raid farm, actually. This farm is great mainly because of boat looting. What that means is we're taking zombified piglins out of the mob cap by putting them in these boats in the kill chamber. That allows more to spawn before these ones are even dead. By using looting on the armor stand, much like in the magma farm earlier, the looting applies to all the piglins in the boat and multiplies the drops. Let's hit this a few hundred times. Even though piglins don't provide great XP, this farm definitely gives you plenty, just in the sheer volume. You can see my level shooting up while I use it. Once that's done, I can pull all the nuggets from the chest with item scroller and then craft them up into ingots eventually blocks. I'll probably swap to auto crafting for this, but I've never used it, so it's something that I need to learn still. Crafting up tens of thousands of nuggets into ingots and then blocks isn't something I want to sit here spending my time doing though. I also used an auto clicker for the farm, but it does sometimes break the armor stand. Now I use Tweakeroo's periodic attack, which is basically the same thing. Okay, with over five stacks of gold blocks now, it's time to move on and make a bartering farm. Doing this in your house is dangerous and not recommended by the way. In my 119 series, I ended up bone mealing the fungi and put a tree through my roof, which is a nightmare to clean up. This time it took me 25 tries to get the one fungi I needed, yikes. This prep shulker is coming along well and we have nearly everything we need now. I'm bringing a lot of grass blocks because I'm not building this below the nether roof this time. For the first time I'm putting it on top of the nether roof near the gold farm so I can access bartering whenever I want. At another time I'll build an auto sorter only for the bartering drops and that'll be my main way to separate the drops out. And as I collect pumpkins for the farm it reminds me the usual question I get about Ian's bartering setup is how many piglins do you actually need? Ian recommends 128 and says that's more than enough. But honestly, I always put 192 or three stacks of pumpkins in the dispenser. However, then you go watch the replay of loading up the farm and you realize that fewer than 192 sometimes go into the farm if you do it under the roof in the traditional way. A bunch will die to entity cramming and the carved pumpkins will then despawn. However, today we're gonna solve that issue by mostly using glass to build the containment chambers. It's impossible for the mobs to suffocate in glass, so I'll get a lot more into the farm, over 220 that will live today. And yes, I need a pumpkin farm. After carving the pumpkins and collecting what felt like a thousand seeds, it's time to build the bartering farm. The shulker loader for this is a simple and fast design that lets me put in a variety of items into a shulker and then when I close it, it breaks and gets replaced. The speed I can fill this shulker will come in handy. For the bartering farm itself, I built the glass containment, the same fill chamber that Ian used in the video description, and of course used a soul torch instead of a gate after 118 to make the piglins run away from the gap in the center. This bartering farm is so fast that no gold farm can actually keep up with the rates. With 224 piglins in the farm, I can trade 3.5 stacks of gold ingots every 6 seconds or 35 stacks per minute. That would require a gold farm capable of producing over a million gold nuggets per hour to maintain. So basically this bartering farm is overkill. That's what we like to do around here. I love this bartering farm, and I think the first time everyone sees it, their initial reaction is that it's some sort of magic or broken or it's voodoo or something. It's so incredibly fast and it doesn't feel real. So how did we do? Let's take a look at the loot we collected in just two minutes of trading. Yeah, that, that was two minutes. We have 10 full and three partial shulkers that fast. Now you know why I wanna build an auto sorter for this soon. Some of the trades aren't that useful to me at the moment, like water bottles and spectral arrows or splash fire resistance, but we'll keep the soul sand, blackstone, quartz, obsidian, crying obsidian, string, leather, and a bunch of the other stuff. I'm also adding soul speed 3 to my netherite boots and my frostwalker boots. Before we tackle our last few projects for the day, I want to do a quick dragon egg update. Last time we added just over 2,500 eggs to the monument drop and I showed you how it'll work. As of me recording this, we're just over 22,000 total subscribers and well on the way to that 100,000 mark. After one more layer that's the same as below, we'll start expanding outward, and that'll require more signs to put the eggs on top of. So let's add some eggs, get those signs, 
test the new layer out and see if we can get 5,000 eggs placed today. I passed 5,000 subscribers back on April 2nd, 2023, so if you were subscribed before that day, your egg will be placed today. And if you're new, here's a quick recap. I'm going to be dropping all of these dragon eggs onto the monument below when the channel reaches 100,000 subscribers. Everyone who subscribes is represented by one of these eggs, and the drop will be shaped like a huge dragon egg. The eggs are supported on one sign attached to a single piece of TNT, and when the TNT falls, so will all the signs and all of the eggs. The Dark Oak Farm provides us with thousands of signs, and a dragon egg duper at one of my strongholds is how we get the 100,000 eggs. I currently have just over 20,000 eggs ready to be added to the drop. These stone rings that I've added will allow me to place the new signs for the new layers. This would be much easier if I just wanted to drop a square chunk of eggs onto the monument, but oh no, not me, I have to be fancy. I have to do something fun. Alright, with all the new signs in place, expansion can begin, and this layer will mark just over 5,200 eggs placed. So thank you to my first 5,000 subscribers. It was a long road to find the first 5,000 of you, but we did it. Thank you. And this is how 5,000 of you look. We're 1 20th of the way through the project now. Not bad. This may not seem related to today's projects, but I promise it is. I've been avoiding building an upgraded sheep farm for the whole series so far because I didn't have gold. The farm I like building by Borkon requires a lot of powered rails and gold. I'm putting my sheep farm way out in the end for two reasons. Number one, I want to only run it when I want it running. This farm can produce way too much wool, especially at the size I'm building it. So controlling our AFK stations here is just a good way to limit it. Number two, I want to AFK the shulker farm for shells, but sitting here AFKing just the shulker farm is quite a waste of time if we aren't doing anything else. In this case, I can do both. The farm itself is very easy to build and I'll put an auto sorter for each color on the farm before it's even running. It has auto restock on shears and 96 total sheep, which will be 6 of each color. The most difficult part of this will obviously be moving two sheep thousands of blocks in the end, but I'll just create a long rail track from our gateway here. I still only have one gateway open, so I guess we're using that one. In terms of useless projects in the world, I did build a dirt path all the way from the original sheep farm up to my Tory gate. By the time I got it built and all the way up to the island, I realized there was probably an easier way. I have random wild sheep roaming near my pagoda. If I simply build up a few blocks from there, I can simply coast over to the island with almost zero work at all. I guess there's only one way to know if this is going to work. Much to my surprise, the sheep was unhurt and came through easily. So I grabbed two more and repeated the process. Unfortunately, only one made the journey the second time, but that's all I need. And then walking them on the roof to the stronghold was pretty easy. And moving sheep around is quite easy. Both leads and wheat work as ways to guide them, so it was easy enough to push them into the end portal. And then from there, jump through. They were still attached to the leads, actually, and then I could just walk them up onto the main end island and up to the gateway where I needed them. After breeding them a couple of times to get me babies and a replacement plan, if these two didn't make it, it was time to start the farm. The farm is now built, the sheep are in place, and it's time to dye them. Like I said, we'll make six of each color, although if I ever need, say, a ton of purple wool, we can always just dye 96 sheep purple and get so much wool it's a bit ridiculous. 
While this is open, I can still push all the carts to make sure they're all running, clear out any extra sheep to get into the system, and prepare to close this in. The farm works on the idea that the sheep can eat from any of the blocks underneath them as they move, so they don't have to wait for grass to grow back. The roof over the farm allows the grass to spread back faster, making sure it's always ready to be eaten as well. This is about two and a half times faster than the standard sort of dispenser sheep farm that you might have seen other people build. And then the shear replacement system will keep it full of shears so I never have to touch a dispenser individually. With that done, I can now just clean up my mess from moving the sheep and call this project complete. That's quite a few intense farms today, so let's do something different now. We've already finished up getting full netherite gear, built a magma cream farm, gold farm, bartering farm, and the sheep farm, and added another 2,500 dragon eggs to the monument drop. Let's finish today's episode by relaxing, or at least creating a place we can go to relax. A zen retreat with a large statue on an island near my villager center. Buddha is typically represented through one of five common poses or gestures. The one I'm building today, the name will be on the screen because I'm not going to try and pronounce it and mess it up. But it means peace or protection is one of the most common poses or gestures for a Buddha statue. In a future episode, I'll connect this island to the mainland with a bridge and decorate the river and the island around it. Unfortunately, while recording the end of this episode, I was hit with my first round of COVID and been very, very unwell trying to finish it up, something you can probably hear in the voiceover. Hope you enjoyed this one anyways, and I'll try my best to get another one done soon. Thanks, I'll see you then. Goodbye.